Okay, lovely folks. I'm so grateful to all of you for staying around, and I'm sure Nathan is as well. So uh, you do recognize the same last name. <laughs> this is my eldest son, Nathan, and uh, he is going to tell you a bit about the Climate Motivator program that he's been employed uh, by the National in Church, uh, Church for uh, throughout this summer. And uh, part of that, as part of that project, he uh, needed to be connected to a community of faith. So he's been connected to us. <laughs> and uh, part of his um, project is to do some education around black bears. He's gonna do that with, he's, he's gonna say the whole thing. But anyway, um, he really needs no welcome, but let's welcome him anyway. Nathan. Hello, North Vancouver. I must say, you're all looking lovely today. I have a very important topic to broach, so I do hope you'll be the kind, respectful, open-minded people I know you are. Today, I'm going to talk about black bears and their role in society and the food chain, and what we can do to ensure both of our species are safe from each other. But before we begin, I'd like to say I'm doing all this as part of the Climate Motivator Program for the National Church. In the Climate Motivator Program, we went to Ontario for about a week to train for the job, and it was basically a retreat, really. But uh, we learned a lot about climate and how to advocate for it. Our goal, that is our goal in the, sorry, in the project, in the program. It focuses around the idea of advocating for a specific project regarding climate action, which we create ourselves. I had a bit of experience with this in the past. Uh, with I've attended a couple climate marches and shore cleanups in the past, and I've tried to be the strongest voice for the climate action I can in my life, although a uh, screaming little child isn't always the best. <laughs> Anyways, uh, without further ado, let's begin. To start off, how many of you lovely audience members have seen a black bear in person? <laughs> exactly. Black bears are quite visually distinct from many other animals. They are exceptionally large and strong, weighing between 132, pretty small, and 661 pounds, very, very large. They are omnivorous, meaning they eat both plants and meat. Despite their name, black bears can also be brown, such as with cinnamon bears, a subspecies, or white, in the case of spirit bears. When compared to grizzly bears, black bears are smaller, do not have a shoulder hump, which I learned not too long ago is like a lump of solid muscle that they use for primarily digging, which is interesting, uh, and have a protruding face. The American black bear can be found almost anywhere in Canada and used to populate nearly all of the United States and even a decent portion of Mexico. There's also the Asiatic black bear, but we're talking about the American one today. So, here in North Vancouver, as you all illustrated with your hands, uh, black bear sightings are quite common. We see them both while out and about and in our backyards. Black bears often enter human civilization in search of food scraps in our garbage, as not only have they lost a significant amount of their habitat to deforestation and wildfires, and thus a sizable portion of their food sources, even our trash is, to other animals, a near unlimited wellspring of nutrition. The problem is that when bears enter human civilization, the two species are bound to encounter one another. Like I mentioned earlier, bears are in possession of extreme physical strength and so can easily pose a threat to human life. Conversely, Humans, with all our technology, are almost unstoppable. Most unfortunate encounters between humans and bears are the result of poor management of the situation by humans. So it is up to us to be responsible and ensure that everyone comes out of these encounters okay. The American black bear plays an imp extremely important role in our local ecosystem as a large predator it helps to control the population of its prey, both by directly hunting other animals and by discouraging reckless population growth and food consumption simply with the threat of its presence. 
Generally speaking, uh, the theory is that, uh, not just, it is proven, just to be clear, that's just called a theory in the scientific sense. Uh, when, if you're ever wondering why carnivores exist, uh, it's because uh, an overpopulation of herbivores would essentially cause these herbivores to eat all the vegetation in the area and then they would all starve. So that's why they're necessary. Uh, additionally, it poses a constant source of competition and balance to other far more aggressive predators such as cougars. As I'm sure you're all aware, cougars are a much bigger problem compared to bears. They're very aggressive and nasty, really. With North Vancouver's grizzly bear and gray wolf populations being nearly non-existent, it is all the more critical that the remaining large predators of the region be protected from sharing their fate. While it is true that the American black bear population is not currently at risk, it is worth considering the contents of this map, which depicts the range of of black bear populations, both historical, in pink, and current, red. This, alongside the grizzly bear and gray wolf populations, the de population declines across the continent, showcases that localized extinction is a frighteningly real possibility. And so it is imperative that action be taken to prevent this from happening. You can see here, as I illustrated earlier, that uh, black bears used to live all over the United States and even in quite a bit of Mexico. It's unfortunate. Upon sighting a black bear, one's first instinct may be to call the conservation officer line. However, before you do this, it's important to know exactly what happens when a black bear is reported. While the common assumption is that black bears that are reported will be relocated to a mountaintop or some remote forest, the truth is far different. The overwhelming majority of black bears that are reported are subsequently shot. The aforementioned assumption about translocation is very harmful as it can lead to the loss of a bear's life without one's knowledge. Know this, if you report a black bear, post a picture or video of a black bear, or otherwise publicly reveal one's location, there is a very strong chance that you have, whether intentionally or not, condemned that bear to death. If you've done this in the past, it's not your fault, you didn't know, it's okay. And I'm not calling the conservation officers evil, just to be clear. Uh, they are bound by protocol, so they do essentially have to do this. So far, I've outlined what defines a black bear, what their current situation is, what happens when a black bear is reported, and also touched on the impact they have on our ecosystem. All that is great information. But why does it matter? Why do we care what happens to black bears? First off, as previously mentioned, they keep order in the natural world, preventing local ecological collapse. Building on that, the love of the outdoors is a defining characteristic of our local identity in North Vancouver. And so if said natural world were to fall into decline and lose its luster, so too would our very culture begin to degrade. Think about a North Vancouver where we don't go walking, hiking, skiing, or swimming. Truly empty and boring existence. Finally, above all, this is, at the end of the day, an animal rights issue. Do these wonderful creatures truly need justification to, for why they need to, for why they deserve to be able to live in peace? All life is beautiful in its own way. What right do we have to pick and choose what parts of nature to cherish and which to destroy? These creatures have as much right to life as we do. We've made many mistakes surrounding our environment in the past. Whether because we didn't know what would come about as a result of our choices or because we simply didn't care. But here and now is our chance to fix that. To become the paragon of natural beauty. I know we can be. And the only way to accomplish it is to work together. So then, I suppose the big question that remains is, what can I do to help? Fortunately, there are plenty of ways you can do your part in defending our ursine friends. Always make sure to adequately steal your garbage, as bears won't have any reason to come to food they cannot access. Keep in mind, when you're stealing away your garbage, think this. Could a 300-pound animal capable of climbing 
get into this garbage? If the answer is yes, seal it a little harder. <laughs> when possible, travel in groups while within bear territory, or failing that, make sure to carry non-lethal tools, such as bear bells or bear spray to ward off bears. A side note, I once saw a post about this by the Oklahoma Board of Parks. Uh, bear spray does not work like bug spray. It is a very strong pepper spray. Do not spray it on yourself. <laughs> Try to avoid reporting bears to conservation officers. Again, conservation officers are not villains, to be clear, or posting them on social media. Instead, report them only to the North Shore Black Bear Society. I actually talked with the North Shore Black Bear Society. They gave me a lot of helpful feedback on what to do with, uh, well, I'll explain it in a minute, but uh, it was really nice and they gave me a lot of information. It was very helpful. Um, finally, sign my petition, QR code on screen, to help ensure that bears and humans can coexist peacefully and be safe from each other. Right, that is true. Uh, the the e-news letter has also linked my petition in it, so if you don't want to sign the QR code right now, you can just uh, look at that later. No pressure to sign, just I would really appreciate it and be very nice. And tell us how many signatures Right, so I don't recall the exact number, but last I checked, we had over 7,000 signatures. Whoa. So we're doing right. Are you open to taking questions? Of course, I'm very open. David, who's, who's the petition going to? Uh, specifically, it's going to our current MLA, Susie Chant. I have spoken with her, and she has uh, talked about how she would be willing to potentially put this forward to, uh, well, yeah, to the decision-making boards responsible. Right. So if you don't know how to use a QR code, uh, basically you just take your phone and you, you point the camera at the QR code and it should uh, show up with a link that you can click. Yeah. Uh, not anymore, she retired a little while ago but she, but uh, she still is very connect, very much connected to the whole thing. Uh, I haven't looked up the exact population statistics, but the thing I do know the thing that got me into this uh, project in the first place was I was looking at the public records for uh, black bears who were translocated, uh, destroyed, or hazed, as in deterred with non-lethal methods. And well, the all-time high for black bears uh, destroyed was in September 2016, maybe 2015, at 216 bears destroyed. On the North Shore. Oh yes, just in North, well, no, that's, sorry, that's in BC, that's in BC. But I would like to point out that on top of that, uh, zero bears were translocated in that time and only eight cubs of the God knows how many were sent to rehab. So what do, what do the conservation officers, what are they found to do? Well, there are specific protocols for when they have to destroy a bear. Generally speaking, the law is that, as I could be, this might not be entirely accurate, but I'm, as far as I know, the way that generally works is that if uh, a bear has been like cited as just being dependent on human food, like if it's coming into garbage and all that, it's generally destroyed almost all the time. Has the district been at all helpful in looking at this situation uh, with you? Uh, I have spoken to uh, I have spoken to our MLA, and yeah, like I said, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I haven't, I've only, the only government members I've talked to about this was uh, RMLA, so, uh, but other than that, I haven't really heard anything from the district. Okay, thank you for your talk. Oh, just a comment, 
a couple of years ago, a bear went into my neighbor's right. house, like into the house. Right. And um, I saw that from our dad, right. <laughs> like ripped off their screen right. door and went right in the house, and they were an elderly couple. So I thought they were in there, and I was really worried for them, of course, because the bear literally went inside. So I called 911 because I thought they were in the house, because anyway, and my husband was like, you know, you should have done that. They're going to kill the bear. He was really mad at me. But I didn't know what to do in that situation. I don't know what you guys would do in that situation, but I was really worried for their safety, right? Anyway, so yeah, so then they sent the police, and then they brought the conservation officer, and I was hoping, yeah, they would maybe relocate this bear. Anyway, I made them promise they'd call me back later and let me know what they did. Anyway, they, yeah, they, they killed the bear. Yeah. But, but the point is I called the district because those neighbors often had food outside. They actually fed raccoons. It's really bad. Mm. But I did call the district to see what they could do, you know, to, because really it was those, it's, their, it's the people's fault. And the yeah. district really didn't do, they didn't do anything. Yeah. They said they would send someone out to ed provide them some education. But, the, but I don't know if they did. And the North, the Bear Society that you're talking about, mm -hmm. the Bear, um, Black Bear Network? Sure. Yes, I called her and she was the most helpful of anybody. And they go out and do education? Yes. Yeah. And so I think the district isn't super helpful. It's the Black Bear so we, we do have um, first-hand experience of what the district does in this community. So uh, we have had a black bear in our garbage, in our church garbage, and um, I did not realize that the garbage, our, our garbage container was not getting locked. And as uh, Nathan was saying, if, a 300, if you think that a 300-pound bear can get into your garbage, then you need to do something to secure it. So, you know, the big iron bar that goes over the garbage, a 300, if I can lift that, a 300 pound bear can. So we've been given warnings, and the last warning we were given, we were told that if a bear is reported in our garbage again, that will be a $500 fine to the church. So that, I would say that that's how the district is trying to help uh, the issue is by by enforcing bylaws around securing your garbage. Yeah. How many more? Oh, yes. I'm concerned that we're putting our food garbage outside before it's been picked up, right? Can we not have like we do it at home with the green garbage? We have a green garbage bin and it is inside the building. There's no it, it is kept inside the building. Well, that's recycling. That's that's not food. Well, because they were trying to get into just about anything. They were trying to get into garbage too. Yeah. <laughs> just wanted to add. Don't think the locked shed is going to keep the bear alive. We have personal experience. <laughs> Absolutely. They, when the reason they're coming to us and trying to grab our garbage in the first place is because they, out there in the wilderness, because of, they've lost so much of their habitat and there's, in, because of the impacts of climate change, they don't have enough food out there to sustain themselves. So inevitably some of them have to come down here and try to grab what we have because we've got plenty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One question, like, could you elaborate a little bit on bear relocation? Years ago, it was the in thing that we were, you know, they were collecting the bear and flying it in there or whatever else. What, that has failed miserably, hasn't it? Sorry, uh, could you repeat? Relocation, relocating bears, trapping them and then flying them into some remote area. Is that still in existence? It does happen, but it's not particularly common. Uh, 
Another great uh, area to explore in that regard would be uh, hazing in that like essentially make, equipping our garbage with uh, tools to, I don't know the particular sciences behind it, but essentially making it so the bears do not want to get our garbage. Like, I don't know, it might smell like something horrible f to them or like, you know, I don't know, again, I don't exactly understand how it works, but I do know that that has been a fairly successful method at deterring bears because if they can, they are at the end of the day very similar to dogs in that if they see that something is, uh, like if they, if they keep trying something again and again and they don't like it, and every single time they don't like it, they're gonna learn that they shouldn't do that anymore. Whereas the opposite is also true. If they eat garbage successfully, all they learn from that is they can do it again. I hope we have our garbage locked up well now <laughs> at the church. We do? Good. Is there something in particular that um, you could spray or something on your garbage can that deter would deter them? I'm not f entirely familiar with uh, how that works personally, but I would recommend looking into it. Uh, to answer that question, my wife Leslie is the block watch captain on our street, so all the bear complaints go to her. And so she was advised to spray our garbage and our compost and whatnot with pine saw. And so we started doing that, and then the bear stopped. Um, came, came back a couple of times, but it's nowhere near. We were getting hit every week. And now it's, uh, they come and they don't get anything. Uh, so they don't seem to like it. I'm not saying it's a cure-all, but it's something to try, and it's readily available. And it doesn't harm them if they eat it? I don't know. <laughs> So Nathan, I'm just going to say thank you again on behalf of everyone here. And um, I also just wanted to share a little bit that, I, so just to expand out on these climate motivators, there are 12, 12, yes, young people. They're all across the country. And so when they came together in Ontario for some training and support, there were 12 of them that came together. And then they meet with each other on uh, Zoom almost every day of the week, don't you? And uh, so this is a program that our national church has, uh, it's a student grant program that the national church has put on. And uh, Nathan has also had a mentor from here in the congregation. So Jeffrey Smith has been his mentor that he's met with a couple of time, who's, uh, times, who's kind of helped you, I think, uh, around policy, mm -hmm. how, uh, how, how to make effective change uh, through government systems. So it's been, I know that it's been a good learning experience for you. And uh, he made a game that uh, he took to Camp Spirit that uh, he tested out on around black bears, right? For the the kids at Camp Spirit in Burnaby last week. So uh, this is, uh, you know, our mission and service fund dollars at work to a certain degree and our government uh, grants at work uh, to support Nathan. So thanks. Thank you. Thank Nathan.